Welcome to Hollywood Ungagged, the Gianluigi Donnarumma of political podcasts. Another fun, crazy, packed week in Scottish and UK politics, uh, with more discussion about uh, Labour's position on a possible independence referendum in Scotland. Former Scottish Labour General Secretary came out and urged the Scottish Labour leader to take a position in support of a multi-option referendum. James Dornan is getting himself into trouble by telling Jacob Rees-Mogg to rotten hell. We'll discuss that. Um, and we'll discuss the upcoming so-called Freedom Day in England when Boris Johnson is planning to pretty much give up and surrender to COVID and, give, and abolish all restrictions pretty much. And we'll also be talking about Conservative MP Andrew Rossendale and his comments about the cut to universal credit. And of course, as ever, we'll be discussing more Tory corruption. Without any further hesitation, let's get ungagged. Hello guys, Brian, Debra, good to see you again. Hello. Good morning. How's your week been? Debra? Hot. It's been too hot. I'm very sorry to complain about this, <laughs> but my demyelinated brain stem does not deal with heat regulation very well. And I'm running about 45 degrees. I can't deal with it. <laughs> As my nana would say, it has been affy clammy. Affy clammy. It's awfully clammy. Awfully close. Fair, that's the word in it. Off a cl- it's awfully close. close. That's, that's one positive thing about being up in the northeast, uh, up in Dundee, because it's... It's never slightly, clammy. It's the, <laughs> well, to be fair, it has actually been clammy for the northeast, but it's um, much fresher than what I've been hearing from the central belt and across of Glasgow. So I'll uh, count my blessings there. How are you doing, David? Not bad. Um, could I... Me, me and my wife had a wee overnight on Saturday in Glasgow because uh, it's our 10th anniversary this week and uh, we basically just slept for 14 hours and then had a buffet breakfast. <laughs> sounds like bliss. <laughs> Congratulations, sounds, by the way. That sounds like a great night away. <laughs> we had grand plans to go to the pictures and things like that and basically just fell asleep. That's what happens when you've got four wanes. You look forward to a night away that much that you just end up recharging your worn down batteries. <laughs> Do you feel rested then? I feel normally tired as opposed to the extreme tiredness that I feel all the time. See, you're just reinforcing constantly my decision not to have children. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Brian likes his naps. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I couldn't. Um, yeah, I just couldn't. <laughs> just leave it at that. <laughs> and you know how you get these people that have kids and then they just constantly tell everybody else how they should have kids? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can see the other side of it. I can see the other point of view in that. Yeah, I love my kids; they're great. Would never have it any other way. But it would be nice to be able to finish a book. I've honestly <laughs> no, I honestly don't think I've finished a book since twenty twelve. I remember what it was it was a biography of the Nazi foreign minister von Ribbentrop, mm-hmm. and I think I just about got to the end. I think I know the ending. They lose. Nazis <laughs> always lose. <laughs> they always, always lose. Yeah, so many people are always like, oh, you should have kids, you should have kids. And I'm like, I'm just really glad that my kid, my friends have got kids. Do you know what I mean? So you can do the nice things and then have a good night's sleep. Win-win, I think. Will we get started then? Or we continue Let's with this go. jibber-jabber? Okay, so first up, we were talking about NDRF, a possible NDRF too again. This, this week it was a former general secretary of Scottish Labour. He said, recommended that his party should distance itself from Keir Starmer and in order to be successful again in Scotland, that they should support a multi-option referendum. He came out with that before Keir Starmer really sort of proved his point by just before the 12th of July going to Northern Ireland and declaring that how much he believes in the United Kingdom and he would campaign for Northern Ireland to stay part of the United Kingdom. Sorry, my mum's shouting at me now. <laughs> Everything okay? Yeah, it was just mum asking if she went, wanted me to go and eat Caroline. I was like, no, I sent a text message to say... But, te- but phones are a one-way communication device for my mum. <laughs> <laughs> so, Keir Starmer, 
arch arch unionist as it turns out and what do you think should Labour go for a multi-option referendum? Well, I was just going to say, I think they've been listening to our podcast because we were just talking about this, that the only way for Labour to get a comeback in Scotland is to just be more open about the idea of independence and be less uber unionist. I mean, that's what the Tories are there for, isn't it? They're the uber unionists. It's a, yeah, really but... taking it to a new level. I mean, that's, <laughs> his position is way to the right. Or I think anybody, like, I don't even think... <laughs> I don't even think Tory Prime Ministers are committing explicitly to that in terms of Northern Ireland. Yeah, when it comes to Northern Ireland, I mean, if you are leader of the opposition uh, at Westminster, I think it's probably best just to respect the decision of people in Northern Ireland. I think that's probably the most important yeah. position to have and perhaps facilitate whatever the people in Northern Ireland would like, whether that's a border poll, whether that's to remain in the UK, and uh, whatever that looks like, then I think it's really important for the leader of opposition to, to just facilitate that and, and uh, stand up for democracy, particularly in, in that area. And I would just echo that in Scotland too, um, that, yes. you know, <laughs> I think distancing themselves from Keir Starmer is a good idea in general. <laughs> I think it's, it's <laughs> probably a really, really good idea. And, you know, like you said, Deborah, we, we've spoken about this uh, at length, particularly about Scottish Labour's position on NDRF2, because it's the only one that is really quite hard to believe in, because it just doesn't make any sense. So yeah, the Tories, you know, we're the, you know, one nation, one Tory ideology position, and that's absolutely fine. We've got the SNP and Greens that support independence, Lib Dems, does it really matter what the Lib Dems really think? But, you know, they believe in the EU and they believe in the UK, but we know those things don't really marry up anymore, but we'll just pretend that that does sound good. Um, but then you've got Labour that's just sort of kicking the can down the road is, is you know, the perfect way that Scottish Labour have kind of dealt with this issue. And it's very much not within this parliament because, you know, we've got a lot to think about with coming out of COVID and these types of things. Well, yeah, we do. Um, but actually, that's the point, <laughs> that we do need to have these discussions and we do need to really look at what powers we have and, um, and then what the people of Scotland actually want the recovery of COVID to actually look like and, you know, not just kick the can down the road and say, oh, well, that's a problem that we'll come to at some point. Yeah, that doesn't really wash. Yeah, I mean, I think we spoke before as well that the kind of multi-option Devo Max stuff is really sort of, I think there was a, a time for it, but I think the time's passed now. But for Labour, that might be a decent sort of position to argue. You know, it sort of distinguishes them for the Tories. They can still campaign as unionists, but you know, they can become the sort of devolutionist party. Um, <laughs> it's so a tongue twister. Devolutionary. I'm just going to say it. Yeah, so I think that's decent advice from, I think it was Michael Sharp, uh, mm-hmm. the former General Secretary. Ah, in terms of Keir Salmer, he's just, I mean, he's just becoming a total disaster. I think his favourite favourability ratings are lower than Boris Johnson. Wow. I mean, how is that possible? A lot of people th- in England love Boris Johnson, don't they? So. Yeah. I don't think anybody anyway likes Keir Starmer too much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't Devo even Max have. Is, I'm sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> this is going we've wild. Got, today. We've got, we've not got much to say about him really. I think that's what it is. He's such a damp squib, like, and then he yeah. comes away with this ultra, you know, Northern Irish uh, unionism. It's like, where'd that come from? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's just a cat candy attempt to sort of triangulate some kind of extreme nationalist vote in England. I mean, I mean, there's no votes in Northern Ireland to be won for, mm. for Labour, you know, they don't, they don't stand candidates there. So it's like, what are they, what is he really getting to gain out of this? I, mm-hmm. I doubt that ideologically, particularly wants to involve himself in Northern Ireland, but I don't know, they just, the Labour right are always thinking they're so much more clever than they are in terms of, you know, oh, you can pick off some voters here with this wee dog whistle and this there, mm-hmm. and really, anybody that anybody that supports that position, I doubt was ever going to vote Labour anyway, and plenty of people will be quite turned off me hearing that kind of thing. Yeah. Parti- particularly just before the 12th of July, when there's people setting up bonfires with kill all tags written on him, stuff like that, and he's gone there in a fucking charm offensive. Yeah, the, the, the timing was, you know, particularly uncomfortable to watch I think but either it was tone deaf or it was planned because it just seems a little bit too convenient for that to be the case yeah you find I find I ask that quite a lot about Starmer is it a deliberate mistake or was it just idiocy I find myself thinking that a lot too 
when it comes to to UK Labour, to be honest. But then, you know, you've got people saying that, you know, Keir Starmer's playing the long game. We don't have a general election, you know, for whatever whatever it's meant to be, another three years or something like that. And you think, when does the game start? Because (laughs) I really don't think that anything that's been done since, you know, since Keir Starmer took over in 2020 um, has actually helped that long game at all I think it's probably taken it away I think that what they tried to do at the start was not have a clear position on anything and hopefully that the Tories would hand them that you know the, the sort of support because we thought we can see it and how terrible that the UK government is handling basically everything um that, that you know particularly the pandemic and, and all these types of things but that's not happened and now we're starting to see little fragments of what would be policy and they're really not nice. <laughs> Labour, you know, we, we spoke about the Batley and Spain by-election, and that, I think, would have been the end of Keir Starmer had they lost that seat. But the fact that they just, you know, just held on to it is, is basically a way of representing Keir Starmer's leadership in Labour that he's just hanging on yeah. with the support of certain groups of people. But that's no way to go into the next general election. Seemingly, the... Uh, plenty of the sort of centrist and right of the party are, would be quite happy to knife Keir Starmer tomorrow. But what what is really hold, holding them back is they're worried about the current election rules. That if they done in Starmer, the left might get somebody back in, mm-hmm. like in a successor to Corbyn. So they're all pushing for him to change the election rules to make that difficult to happen. To stop oh. somebody, a left candidate. Mm-hmm. So he's in a situation where he probably quite likes the idea of changing the election rules, but at the moment it's probably the only thing keeping them in power because yeah. as soon as they change, they've got no reason not to just bin them. And God, mm-hmm. God knows who the Labour right would conjure up to put in. I mean, I, I don't know what the next future leader would be of, of the Labour Party, the next one anyway. We know that Andy Burnham's chomping at the bit, but that won't be for, for, for this cycle, I don't think, of, of any leadership. I hope it's a woman. Yeah, well, that yeah, well, that would be yeah, something, wouldn't it? It's pretty overdue, considering Just the Tories have had two female prime ministers now. I mean, it would be a good start. I can't even tell you who I would particularly feel quite enthusiastic about, to be honest. But it would be good to see Labour actually have a leader that is doing well. I mean, that's meant to be what the centrists and the right always say that we need to be electable. Well, that's not working. So yeah. <laughs> why don't you actually try adopting some of the policies that were extremely popular? So if you look at Corbyn and the, the actual polling of some of the, the policies was really, really high when you took the party label off it. So things like, you know, the, the, the access to, to uh, broadband and all these types of things were really popular. Perhaps the Tony Blair is always not going to work again, you know, so yeah. come up with something else. Yeah, it's almost as if the world changed a bit since the 1990s. Um, mm. The problem, I think, as well with the... Uh, Labour as well, thinking about who would I like to sort of see take over is you don't really know what any of them really are going to be like because Keir Starmer's so different to how he portrayed himself when he was running for the leadership. Mm-hmm. He was running as the sort of soft left, unifying figure and the only thing he's done with any sort of conviction is, you know, try to crush the left of the Labour Party. You know, so it might be easy to say now, oh, Angela Rayner might be quite good. She's not, right, she's not a total Corbynite, mm-hmm. but she's kind of seems a bit of a lefty. Who knows what she'd be when she was in power, though? Like, she might just do exactly the same as Starmer's done and fly fly to the extreme right and try to crush all, all, half the people that voted for her. What's the saying? Power corrupts. Absolute power absolutely corrupts. Yep. I don't know if that's relevant now because I don't know how powerful the leader of Labour is considering, that's what I was thinking, yeah. <laughs> considering the performance Keir Stammer's putting in. I think it's, it's a really apt thing to say because we're having this conversation in the sort of ridiculous Tory Labour binary of the UK. So we're, mm-hmm. you know, that, that in itself is we talk about absolute power. Well, it does corrupt because if Labour, the new Labour, you know, who was in power for 13 years. They could have changed the electoral rules if they wanted to. Um, they could have had a, a more influential role in the, the referendum in 2011 to bring in rep, uh, proportional representation. So, Or they could at least have a policy now to, to acknowledge the fact that the, the electoral system needs to change. So, yep. you know, Labour in itself can, can talk about being progressive. They can talk about, you know, want to bring in change, but it has to be on their terms. And I think that that's really, really problematic. And I think that that in itself has actually fed into quite a lot of the growth for support for Scottish independence and the the growth for for the the desire for perhaps a border poll in in Northern Ireland and also the the sort of slowly growing support 
in Wales too. The evolution was never the answer. It was, you know, the first stepping stone for people to realise that things could be done differently. Yeah. And that sort of backfired on them, unfortunately. Yeah, if I had a sort of magic wand to change something in UK politics, it would be the voting system, because so much of the toxic elements kind of emanate for that. Total electoral reform, then? Yeah, look, I mean, if you had some kind of more proportional system, it would lock the Tories out of any sort of majority government, because, you know, there is no um, overall majority for that kind of, I don't know if it goes so far as far right, but certainly right wing policies like they get in because because people are forced into a kind of binary and the left or well not left the sort of progressive if you want to be kind sort of voting across England is split across Labour and to the left the Labour and the Lib Dems uh, you know if you, you would have a kind of a more, more likely a kind of perpetual centrist very very slight left I think um, coalition that would be running things instead of a perpetual Right wing border on neo fascist government that yeah. England ends up with all the time. Mm-hmm. And I think if you look at um, Spain, for example, because um, I know that there's this pr- promotional to some extent, that they, um, if they do produce a, a right wing government, it's the popular party, they need the support of centrist parties or they need the support of some other parties to, 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 to navigate. Because um, what they've got at the moment is, you know, the, the sort of Center left party is being propped up by a, a, a left party, the Demos. So it's these are how these sort of governments have to operate, and they need to be done with agreements with smaller parties. So you know, if we look at it in the UK context, we would see the Lib Dems play a role in that. The SNP, uh, Plaid, Greens, all of these, they would all, uh, you know, SDLP, all these other parties would have some stake in forming a sort of function in government that, that would operate. So we wouldn't have, you know, the, the Tories, you know, pushing their whole manifesto through um, yeah. and actually they only get 43% of the vote. Yeah, there's just so many things that are a good argument for independence at the end of the day. Yeah, and I, do I think that the, the actual true proportional representation or even just a fairer voting system will come into the UK? No, I don't. And I don't think it'll happen under Labour and I don't think it'll happen. Um, certainly won't happen under uh, the Conservatives. I mean, I, I suppose the closest the UK came was in uh, 2010 with the coalition government. Mm-hmm. But I mean, that was just bungled from the point of view of the Lib Dems. You know, the fact that they agreed to put it to a referendum, as much as I agree in proportion, a more proportional system, I voted against the alternative vote for two reasons. It was because of all the systems, it was the the least proportional that they could have chose, mm-hmm. which in reality, it would have probably not helped any other party other than the Lib Dems. And two, I was so angry at the Lib Dems, I was just happy to see them lose anything. And I think that mm-hmm. was that was why it lost in the end. It was also done on the, the uh, local elections day in England, wasn't it? So yeah. it, was, it wasn't... Um... And there's so many people that you that even that are quite into politics and stuff that you talk about that referendum and a lot of people don't remember it happened, which is in itself quite interesting. I might be one of those people. I, yeah. <laughs> I vaguely remember the alternative vote, but mm-hmm. uh, I don't think I was, I, I don't even remember voting in it. I probably did. Uh, what, there was a, what, what elections would it have been that was happening up here? Was it Scottish elections? It, it was the English uh, local elections, I believe, that it happened on the same day as. So yeah. there wouldn't have been anything going on up here. Or there might have been something going on. I cannot there remember. Definitely, there definitely I was, was in England at the time. All right, well, we, I was up here and I definitely voted in another election and the, the, the referendum. So it probably was. Then. It was happening alongside something else. Was it not the Scottish elections then? It might have been then, 20, um, 2012. Because, yeah, 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 no, it was 2011 that it, the actual referendum took place. Anyway, I can't remember. But I was in England at the time anyway. So. If anybody's really interested, check Wikipedia. Yes. Okay, um, let's move on to our next topic then. James Dornan, the SNP MSP, has been reported to the Ethical Standards Commission for j- suggesting that Jacob Rees-Mogg will undoubtedly rot in hell. It was in response to the Conservative MP's post about the Nationality and Borders Bill. He tweeted, The band of blighters bringing illegal entrants to Blighty will be broken up by this brilliant Borders Bill. The Borders Bill gives the power to turn asylum seekers away when they're trying to cross the sea and to use reasonable force, which is sinister. And it also opens humanitarian services up to prosecution for rescuing people uh, at sea. 
and puts them in the same category as people smugglers. So a couple of Tories came out after this and said that James Dornan's comments were beyond the pale. I don't know. I don't, I'm not the biggest James Dornan fan, but I find it hard to disagree with him here. If they think saying somebody will rot in hell is beyond the pale, what exactly is allowing refugees and children to drown to satisfy some kind of outright racism? Because you don't want mere brown people in the country. So that's not beyond the pale, but being cheeky on Twitter is, according to Annie Wells and Stephen Kerr. Well, Thoughts? I'm just... Oh, I'm I'm disgusted by the jovial alliteration. Big, what is it? Jeannie Godley calls him the ghost pencil. Mm-hmm. Haunted He's, pencil. Mm-hmm. Haunted pencil. Yeah, what a horrible human being he is, and he calls himself a Christian. Um, I'm just disgusted by the UK policy and immigration right now. Anyway, we've got removal centres that are overflowing with asylum seekers who aren't being allowed to put in their claim of asylum. They're just getting deported. They're just getting... And the update on the that bill you were talking about that James Dornan was so angry about, you can probably tell I'm also angry. I'm too hot. I'm overheating and I'm raging. Hang on a second till I find the... Yeah, I mean, a, a bit I've like James Dornan, it kind of got under my skin as well. I mean, this is like a really, really serious thing that's happening like really really nasty and horrible and for him to just sort of treat it so lightly uh, Jacob Reese mog with his band of blighters broken up by brilliant borders bill honestly it it's disgusts me I mean what does he find so humorous about the poten- potentially children drowning in the channel yeah, I've just found the thing I wanted to quote. We've got removal centres that are overflowing, right? Hammondsworth Removal Centre near Heathrow Airport, whose capacity is 670, is understood to be overwhelmed. And the Home Office is also filing Brooke House at Gatwick Airport in Colnbrook near Heathrow, combined capacity of 850, with even more small boat arrivals. Right. So the, they're being filled with people who have not just arrived, but who are not being released into the community. These are traumatised in occasion people who have been identified as being victims of torture, victims of human trafficking. And our UK government is putting them back in a detention centre ready to be packed back over the channel. I can't. I'm so disgusted by Pretty Patel and her actions, to be honest. I don't know why she's been so ferocious about this. Has, has she got any compassion? I don't think she does, no. She does, no. That's, that's the answer to that one. And just to, to echo what um, what David was saying there, I'm not the biggest James Donner fan either. And I think what um, if you want to call out these things, that particularly if you're in an opposition party or you're in the SNP particularly, is to be careful how you phrase things to deflect any potential criticism that you might get because he's got a really, really valid point, and particularly with Jacob Rees-Mogg, because... Like you have rightly said, and I completely agree with you, that this policy is disgusting, it is horrific, and we should be completely hauling them over the coals for this, absolutely. And I, I don't even know where to start with it, because, you know, the James Dorner thing is could be, you know, spoken about in, in a couple of sentences. Probably, she, probably, should he have said it? Well, that's up to him. You know, can we condemn it? I don't really care that much, to be honest. I'm more concerned about the substance of this particular policy. Yeah. Um, if Jacob Rees-Mogg is upset by that, I would... Probably just say I'm not to read his Twitter comments, particularly when he sends out religious messages around Easter time, because that's not as bad as what it is. So if he is upset by these types of comments, then he should definitely not read his Twitter comments. Um, however, I would probably say if I did have Jacob Rees-Mogg's attention, is perhaps just not go against you know the, the religious teachings of the religion that you claim to be a part of. And that could be quite a strong thing to say to people. But if you look at any religion... The, 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 you know, the basis of it is about acceptance, support and helping vulnerable people. And if you choose to be part of a UK government that goes completely against that and goes against humanity and goes against looking after individuals, then perhaps you need to look at yourself and reflect um, on your beliefs and your actions and how that plays out on, on vulnerable people. Exactly. And that's the key word, vulnerable people. Mm-hmm. That just, it's horrible. And I don't, I mean, I don't even think what, James Dornan said, was that bad? I think he could have said a lot worse. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I'm an atheist, but I would I would actually accept I'm wrong. I, I would accept that I'm wrong just to know that Jacob Rees-Mogg gets the <laughs> bone in hell. 
I mean, I think also in this bill, I think it opens up the possibility of offshore detention centres as well, so sort of Australian-style mm. ones, which have got a long history of proving uh, to, to like, be extremely abusive. I think there's a was it a couple of years ago, I remember, the, or maybe last year, I remember the Tories raising this possibility. They wanted to open camps off, like, in the Falklands or somewhere remote like that, just to, like, ship people away. And it's just like, why do they need to be so nasty? Why do they need to be such horrible human beings? You know, Because it drums up votes, unfortunately. You remember that horrible Brexit poster that had millions and millions of people coming over the hills into... Britain. The Nazi like one. Aye, that mm. one. This is even beyond that because these are just, you know, we're talking about thousands of people, not millions, and they're all human beings. And we're just, they're, they're trying their hardest to get to our country, seeking some sort of refuge. And we are patting them on boats and sending them away. I just, I can't believe what Britain has become. It actually almost breaks my heart. I don't know what, what Britain's become. become. I, I don't think it was really any better than this, to be honest. I think it used to be. I think it used to be a bit better than what it is. And that's why I don't think James Dornan's comments that bad, because hell is subjective, isn't it? Some people are living in hell. I think it shows as well that the sort of political system is just so messed up when, you know, like a government are bringing in measures that are going to drown children. Mm-hmm. And you know that's all. That's all fine and well as long as you're, as long as we discuss it politely. Don't don't say anything too nasty about the potential child killers because that's just that's that's beyond the pale. I don't know why it was, it was interesting. They both used that phrase, so I'm guessing that's what was sent out in the Tory WhatsApp group to yeah <laughs> push the line against James Dorman. And it's just that sort of moralistic sort of tone, isn't it? Oh, it's beyond the pale. You can't say these types of things that somebody's going to rot in hell. But we can put in policy that's potentially going to kill people and, and has killed people in the past. And you just need to really sit back and reflect on if you are a religious person or you're just a humanist or you are just somebody who cares about the well-being of other people and vulnerable people and think, hmm, is this really what I should be doing with my time? And I think that, you know, what you were what you were highlighting there that you know, what has Britain become? I think over the last couple of years, what we've started to see is a real shift to prioritising policies that directly impact on these small boats, these small boats coming over the channel. And this seems to be the most prominent thing. And what's really, really interesting with that is the fact that it's pandering to a certain demographic of people. And it's pandering particularly to the south of England, because that's where we see these boats and, and, and stuff coming over. And I just really can't help be so cynical that that is done purposely to try and win votes from a certain demographic of people. And that in itself is exactly what the Tories blame the left of doing, is creating these culture wars and doing these different things. They themselves are creating a culture war Mm -hmm. against vulnerable people and making them out to be the problem when actually it's been austerity cuts, it's been ideological cuts, it's been, you know, privatisation of of public services that have led to dissatisfaction and frustration with people not being provided with, you know, the support and the services that they need. And, you know, the the Tories can say, oh, we can point at all these people coming over saying, oh, we're full, we're at breaking point if we look at that poster that Deborah was talking about. And we're not. And what we can do is be an inclusive country and not just scapegoat people and actually look at the people that are responsible for, um, for, for really crap public infrastructure, crap services, and, and you know, basically private companies skimming off the top and benefiting from these. It's also the fact that the the Tories are, de- are, are not dealing with this situation either. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was Kent County Council is begging the government to help them because they're having to really process, like, the vast majority of the people arriving because their arriving happens to be mm-hmm. their area of the country. Instead of having a proper system set up to process and spread people about the country uh, so that you're not having uh, areas that are getting overwhelmed with basically taking a whole nation amount of people instead of you know just taking what their share is and this kind of rhetoric uh, anti-immigration rhetoric it has such a profound impact We're we're seeing it now with the England national team how much impact government has when it comes to the way they talk about things you know, people weren't happy with England players taking the knee against racism. 
And Boris Johnson and Pretty Patel's way to respond to that was to condone the people booing the England players stand, uh, kneeling against racism. And what happens now, uh, they're, they're getting racially abused and the Tories are trying to dissociate themselves from it. Government rhetoric matters so much more than people think. I always think back to remember when the government was desperate to bomb Serbia over Kosovo. Suddenly the government messaging went into overdrive in terms of the plight of the poor Kosovans. And you had situations here where Kosovo, Kosovo refugees were arriving and the local communities were putting out, literally putting out welcome signs for them mm-hmm. because the government was publicised and the government wanted to portray them in a positive light and people responded to that. So why do they then try to act surprised that when they demonise immigrants, demonise foreigners, that people then respond to that negatively and behave that way? This whole pandering to racism is such an excuse as well, because if the government took a positive line about immigration, then, then that, that vote would actually evaporate. There wouldn't be as, nearly as many people to pander to. The next, the next segment's our regular segment, and it is all about more Tory corruption. Tory corruption, more Tory corruption, more Tory corruption, more Tory corruption, more Tory corruption. corruption. A close ally of the Tory party uh, on the BBC Board of Directors has tried to block an editorial appointment on political grounds. Sir Robbie Gibb, I take it that's not the guy from Bee Gees? who was Theresa May's communication director in number 10 and his ties to the Tories, which go back decades, tried to prevent the BBC hiring Jess Brammer to oversee its new news output. Uh, it was reported in the Financial Times that part of Gibbs' resistance to Brammer centres in a row between the Huffington Post, where she was recently editor, and the Conservatives Equality Minister, Kemi Badnock. Uh, after being approached with a series of questions with the Huffington, uh, Huffington Post reporter in January, Badnock embarked on a Twitter tirade about how the site had a vendetta against her, uh, and Bremer then defended her reporter and attempted to force the Cabinet Office to investigate Badnock's conduct. Yet another example of the Tories using influence to try and shape the political narrative. Basically, trying to blackball a journalist for doing her job, and then we wonder why we have such a pander in media, because they're all scared. I mean, it's just more Tory corruption, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and one, one thing I would want to say just about Jess's work, because uh, the having to post news desk was disbanded, I think it was about three or four months ago, um, and Jess's work has always been something that I've always read, actually, and she's been one of the ones that is pretty fearless and kind of puts herself out there and is really, really critical of a lot of instances that were going on within the Conservative Party, so it just sort of highlights even more the, the sort of obvious nature of this, and it's just a real shame that, you know, Jess... Um, wouldn't be able to to try and perhaps shape uh, some of the the news coverage at the BBC, unfortunately. Yeah, solidarity to Jess. Solidarity to Jess. The the BBC that the Tories are always claiming has a left-wing bias. Yeah. And and yet somebody who actually was critical of the government is possibly getting blackballed from a job with the BBC. That does not sound like an organisation that is much a left-wing bias. Hmm. Or, Or that is a true public servant, really, if that's how it's going to be played out, more the public sector of whatever the Conservatives are looking to say is okay at the time. Next topic, the Romford MP Andrew Rossendale. He's come under fire for comments he made about the uplift to universal credit. A £20 boost was applied to the benefit at the beginning of the pandemic last year, but it was recently confirmed that the uplift will end in September. Um, the BBC Politics on BBC Politics Live, Mr. Rossendale said, I think there are people quite like getting the extra £20, but maybe they don't need it. This will mean a cut from £97 a week to £77 a week, but they don't need it. Deborah? I mean, it's £80 a month. That's a family food shop for some people. Do you know what I mean? That's, uh, I'm just, the, the Tories are so. I don't even know what else to say about it. I just, I'm, I'm raging with them. I'm in such a bad mood. It's too, I'm too hot and I'm frightened I'm just going to end up ranting. But this £20, to, the way it's described, it's like, oh, it's an uplift. Why did they need the uplift? Because the an, an initial amount isn't enough money for folk to survive on. 
We know about people having to rely on food banks. We know about the fuel poverty, energy poverty, folk can't pay their bills. I'm just, uh, this guy thinks that that £20 is, you know, a takeaway. But for that £20 for some people is actual food for the table and maybe paying off a bit of their lecky bill that's sky high so that they can cook some food. I'm just, I'm so annoyed with them. And God forbid a poor person get a takeaway every now and again. I know. Right? Yeah, just to echo what Deborah was saying. Um, I mean, this guy has just showed, shown his own ignorance because he's clearly not um, engaging with some of the, the groups um, that, oh. that advocate for a, a change in universal credit and, and a complete change in the whole system. And I think what's really important when we have discussions like this and we see these people being wheeled out and they're talking about the £20 increase, that we don't want to keep the... the the um, discussion too narrow because the 20 pounds okay it definitely needs to stay there but in fact it needs to be a lot higher yes. it needs to be made much easier for people to access and it needs to you know we had a re- you know we had a really in-depth discussion about universal credit last week that was that you know that the listeners sh- should definitely listen to if they haven't already but i think what this just shows is this particular mp's ignorance but it also shows the brazen way that, that you're happy to go on to, you know, mm-hmm. politics live and say that, to say that, you know, I think that it might be quite nice for people to have this £20, but they don't need it. Well, how many people have said that? Or have you just made that up? You know, and I think that this is what's really, really important because we we're talking about rhetoric and rhetoric really matters. And if you are right wing and you don't want to see a robust welfare state put in place and people can just go on and say these things without having any evidence to back it up, that influences public opinion and it influences debate. And I think that people like that need to be reprimanded and there needs to be much more put on elected officials. When they're going on and saying these things, they should be challenged to back that up. They should be saying, well, how many people have you spoken to that said that? You know, what is this organisation saying? What's this? Um, and I think that for, for him to just get away with that, you know, in, in the heat of, of a debate with, with another Labour MP who, who did hold him to account on it, but there should be fact check and there should be um, robust checks in place by the BBC and by these organisations that hold these saying, but wait a minute, there is no evidence to suggest what you're saying and you know it seems to happen um, on qu- uh, programs like question time when it's convenient mm-hmm. i just don't think that it's done regularly enough i think it definitely should be well you know particularly in comments it might be a nice thing but you know people don't need it comments like that must be backed up with evidence and i'm pretty sure and confident that there will not be the evidence to back up that oh because i mean in common sense like 77 pound a week i mean it's nothing mm-hmm. You know, and this idea that, you know, that extra £20 is some kind of luxury on top of that. <laughs> you know, I just had a wee look here at um, Mr. Rossendale's expenses. And I wonder, did he really need a £1,300 spent on a no- mobile phone? Could he not have got one that was a wee bit cheaper? <laughs> no? Or pay for or his did... huge salary himself. Well, that's just that's just beyond the pale, Brian. <laughs> well, correct. Uh, just having a wee look. Did he really need to spend three hundred pound on a TV for his constituency office? Don't know. They seem a bit more extravagant than twenty pound a week for to somebody for somebody to live on. I would like uh, some journalists to ask him what alternative social welfare system he would want. Like how how can you make it better for his constituency uh, constituents instead of making things worse? Because this guy is representing people, isn't he? Mm-hmm. And these people, yeah, and there's folk that are going to be, you know, relying on that extra twenty pound. He's and they might be struggling. I'm pretty sure if you're only getting, you know, that amount of money and you've needed the uplift, that you're going to be having quite a tight. You're going to be living on quite a tight budget anyway. Mm-hmm. So I want him to address what what else can there possibly be? I know what my answer would be anyway. Starts a chant, universal basic income. <laughs> Universal basic income. UBI. 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 <laughs> no, definitely. I think, um, like, like, like we've said, and we're all very much in support of, of the UBI. And, and it's it's funny that, you know, whenever universal basic income is, is spoken about, it's all, first of all, it's all really expensive and we can't afford it. Well, we choose what we spend the money on as a state. So let's just, you know, park that mm-hmm. for a wee minute. But also that the universal basic income isn't the silver bullet that, that, 
that's going to be it. It's not like we're just mm-hmm. going to start giving people money and, and you know, just that's it, you know, poverty is, is gone. It's about, it goes much, much further than just what people are receiving, but it's about who's providing the services and, mm-hmm. um, you know, who is actually providing, you know, we, we spoke at length about, you know, Serco and all these private companies are skimming off the top yep. of all these public services they're doing. Well, you stop that from happening, first mm-hmm. of all, and you can run these services, you know, effectively in-house. And I think that, when it comes to the welfare state, and you know what, I know that this is sort of zoomed right out from the, you know, the discussion about this £20, that there's so much work to be done when it comes to welfare, and there's so much work to be done when it comes to alleviating poverty, that it's crazy that even the Tories are, are not willing to put an extra £20 a week in the pot for people, you know, that needed to be put there in the first place, mm-hmm. like, you, like you said, because it wasn't sufficient for during a pandemic. But if it's not sufficient for during a pandemic, it's not going to be sufficient enough for post-pandemic which, we, which the Tories have been very clear is going to be, you know, economic disaster and there'll probably need to be more austerity cuts and blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, that £20 a week definitely needs to stay. And in fact, let's start investing in people that, that need the money to, 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 to really, really address the, the, the poverty and the inequality that exists in this country. And perhaps, perhaps we might have a healthier economy in doing that too. Yeah, and I think we need to remember as well that they brought that. They only added that extra twenty pound in because at the start of the pandemic, a lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people mm-hmm. that weren't used to the benefit system. A lot of people that maybe Tory voters suddenly had to deal with the benefit system. A lot of middle class people, and they were all suddenly going, eh, "Wait a minute, is is this what it's like?" And of course, that frightened the Tories when people that they see as their people eh, were involved in it. So immediately they were like, "Oh yeah, yeah, no, sorry, we'll bump that up a wee bit." And now that that sort of initial shock and fury has died down a bit now they're thinking right we'll just we'll just go back to go back to the previous sort of levels and see if anybody kicks up a fuss and that's that's what people have to do unfortunately but these are people that are tired people that are probably in precarious work people that are carers people that are vulnerable and it shouldn't fall on them and their organizations and their support functions to have to kick up a fuss every single time the Tories want to cut something because they shouldn't be cutting it for the people that need it. They should be cutting it for, for you know, the tax, you know, giveaways that they're just given away and, and that's been cited many a time in the House of Commons by people like Zara Sultana. Just the amount of tax giveaways that have been done for, for these people and it should not fall on the vulnerable people to constantly keep pushing against this government because they don't have the time, they don't have the energy and they don't have the access either. So just stop it. I think the language the guy used as well was uh, quite reminiscent of back in, you know, the sort of early 2010s. Is that what you call that? The teens? I don't know. I don't know if I've got a name for it yet. (laughs) The sort of 2011, 2012, when it was uh, Poverty Street and you know, mm-hmm. benefits, street, no, you know, all that sort of... Shirkers and murders. Aye, scroungers, all that sort of rhetoric. That was just, a, it was a wee bit reminiscent, a wee throwback to that sort of attitudes. But it's the Tories in it, that is their ideology. Why, why do they need to be such bastards? <laughs> I'm going to cut that. Just... <laughs> <laughs> or just beep it, because it's funnier. <laughs> That's beyond the pale, that comment. <laughs> okay, um, so our final topic today. 19th of July is not far away. Freedom Day in England, as it's been dubbed by the Tories, uh, where they're basically throwing out all COVID restrictions. Face mask, masks will no longer be mandatory. All businesses will be able to remain open with no caps and capacity. Mass events will be allowed to restart. There'll be no requirement for business to collect details for track and trace purposes and an end to social distancing. This is all coming at a time when infection rates are soaring again. Somebody explain this, the logic of this to me, because I don't get it, please. Make it make sense. Brian? The only way that I can make it make sense is that the Tories want the economy to go back to the way it was in 2019, and that's why they're doing it. So that's, that's, that's the only justification from the Tories that I can to really try and understand what it is that they're trying to do I can't beyond that I can't I, I do not understand and and I was genuinely surprised actually when this announcement came because I was expecting it to be Boris Johnson you know started over and saying well we need to keep masks or we need to keep we re- almost like we need to keep one of them like so we'll mm-hmm. keep you know social distancing and, and you know masks and blah 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 I was genuinely surprised it was as extreme 
that's what it was because this is extreme and I think that that needs to be kind of couched as that because a lot of people are like oh it's just turning back to normal well normal would be where we didn't have a deadly virus floating yes. around so this isn't normal so that you know just that's a really really important point that is not going back to normal. And when it comes to economics and how things operate, I don't want to go back to what normal was. I don't want to go back to normal. You know, do we want more, you know, the ability to, to go around and be be freer? Of course we do. But we don't want to do that at the expense of hurting potentially vulnerable people. And, you know, I'm aware that the deaths have plummeted massively. The um, hospitalizations, although they are increasing, are not at the same levels as what they were before. But what we're doing is potentially focusing on a different group of people now because where there is still risk attached to older people and, and, and vulnerable people and I'm not discounting that but we're shifting now where a lot of people that are not vaccinated are, are younger people mm-hmm. um, and what we're potentially looking at is bringing on a massive wave of long COVID on people and that and is is just I, I can't quite believe that this is the situation that we're in and, you know, the right always say, yeah, but, you know, we, we need to open the economy, blah, blah, blah. Well, if you'd followed the advice back in March 2020, ideally before then, really, because mm-hmm. we had these these other countries that had dealt with pandemics before and we hadn't tried to open up too early last year when we had no vaccination happening, then perhaps we wouldn't be in this position. And I believe that the, the outcome of this pandemic falls at the door very much of the neoliberal establishment, to be honest, because these... These people were so reluctant to close down. They were so excited about getting things opened up and, and back to normal. We didn't want to close down the borders, ironically, you know, during these times because we needed to keep the, the economy going. That that whole urge to try and keep things as normal has actually prolonged the, the, the pandemic. It's caused so many people to die unnecessarily and it's caused people to be separated for, for, for so long because I'm so mindful like you know I was on my own for three months because my partner was a carer and um, you know there's people that can't get home to see their families because they're in different countries and that it falls at the door of the, the people who made decisions to try and open things up too early. Yeah Deborah? I would like to try and explain it in the form of interpretive dance <laughs> let's go round again like see see as you said if they had sorted themselves out back in 2020 preferably 2019 when Mm -hmm. the pandemic was you know first identified and they got all the reports and all the rest of it that we've spoke about a million times but this freedom day it's a fallacy it's not freedom day it's not to a vulnerable people in england who this is this is the government advice i'm about to read to you going to shops and pharmacies Clinically, extremely vulnerable people are now advised to follow the guidance that applies to the rest of the population. You may still wish to consider going to the shops and pharmacy at quieter times of the day. Priority access to supermarket delivery slots using shielding support website ended on the 21st of June. After the 21st of June, you can continue to book delivery slots in the usual manner. So... I mean, there's no freedom for those folk, is it? Because they've just been told, get on with it, you're all right. When mm-hmm. they're, they're being identified as clinically extremely vulnerable. What? I just, I'm, I'm at a loss of words, really. I'm just, I go back to dancing. Freedom Day is such, so Orwellian. Really, it should be Surrender Day, because that's what they're doing. They're just surrendering to COVID and just saying, right, just do your worst. We'll just have to put up with it. I mean, what really worries me is... I mean, we were kind of getting through it. We were nearly, we were mm-hmm. nearly there in terms of mm-hmm. uh, beating COVID. And what happened? The Delta variant mm-hmm. uh, get in, and how? Where did that come from? It came from India, and why did it come from? How did it arise? It happened because COVID managed to get out of control there and burnt through the population. I wouldn't be surprised if all the other countries put Britain in a total. Never mind a red list, a black list, and mm-hmm. lock is down because mm-hmm. we're just creating the conditions for another variant. And what kind of variant are we going to get? We might get one that like a doomsday scenario where a variant that suddenly Disney the vaccines don't work on and we're back to square one. I'm planning a, a winter lockdown because I think that's what we're going to end up. Well, infections will slowly rise, hospitalizations will slowly rise, and then eventually come November time, they'll probably panic and the Tories will be forced to put us back into an extreme lockdown again. And we're setting Christmas in the trot, no scene around there. It's, it's depressing. And it, it just goes back to the complete incompetence of the UK government. Mm-hmm. Contrast it with the Scottish government, what they are saying, saying get, 
you know, test yourself twice a week. I just done a test before we started the pod. It has come back clear and I'll go and register that. But I've got to register it on the UK website and the QR code doesn't work for some reason. I need to enter the thing, which just is another UK failing in it. I'm just, I'm, I'm scunnered or not. It is really depressing, but I kind of think that we've got maybe another option in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> we we definitely have another option, and I think it'll be interesting to see what Nicola Sturgeon puts out uh, as as the the sort of what we do going forward. You know, I think uh, from the end of July, I believe that's coming later this week or next week. But what she has what she has said is that this whole Freedom Day narrative and the fact that England's opening up and that, that there is going to be an increase in cases because Scotland at the moment there's a lot of cases going around and it's nucleated mm-hmm. in certain areas. Dundee being one of them. So uh, there is a real dilemma for, for the Scottish government and what they do and what they can physically do, because we know that closing the border is too much of a political issue. Although I read it's, a thing today on Facebook that the border was closed when the Stone of Destiny was stolen. So it is possible. <laughs> it is possible. <laughs> well, there you go. But um, And I know that, you know, the, the advice back in sort of December time was that Scotland should have closed its border with England. We know that a lot of the, the new variants of COVID that, that had to came back into Scotland was from the south and, and from uh, abroad, where people were travelling and coming back from, from, uh, from around the world. But that in itself is, you know, a little bit too political because that's Nicola Sturgeon hating the English again. So we kind of have that. Yeah, it's just this Freedom Day announcement and how it's been couched, particularly in England, has been almost like the end of COVID. It's over, it's gone. It causes a lot of problems for the other nations in yeah. UK, Wales and uh, in Scotland and uh, Northern Ireland because it puts political pressure on them and it puts it basically puts them at risk as well because ultimately England is such a huge part of the UK so I mean there's not really much that we can really see just now because we don't know what's going to happen but there has been indication that it's not going to be quite as extreme as what it is in England but then of course there's going to be political pushback on that so which is going to descend into you know Tories saying they need to do more uh, they need to be, you know, open things up further. And then once the cases start to go up again, the Tories will say that they're not controlling the virus enough. So it's just, you know, it's, it's just creating more political vacuum for this nonsense discussion between they should be doing this, they should be doing that. Well, actually, I think we know from what Sage is saying and what, what the independent Sage is saying that the UK government shouldn't be doing all that it's doing. So the Scottish government should be listening to these people and not to political pressure. And you're already seeing it in the media. The Scottish mm-hmm. government getting questions saying, uh, why are you not following the approach? And I'd like somebody for the Scottish government to turn around and say, because that approach is mental. <laughs> That's why we're not following it. Mm-hmm. And it's even, it's like, and all through this, the Scottish government have always been sort of less willing to give like fixed dates. Like they said, look, we're looking at possibly restrictions might lift in this date, but it's not set in stone. But the Tories are looking at a big chisel out and saying, it's definitely happening in this date. And you're like, <laughs> What, what happens if the data is saying that it would be the, a really bad idea? You're like completely committing yourself to do it no matter what. They've painted no, themselves no into a corner. Much. Yeah. Just get, the, get yourself to the point that on the 19th of June, they either have to go ahead with it or create, a, or they take a huge political hit because they've mm-hmm. made such a balls up of sort of committing themselves to a specific date, no matter what the data says, no matter what the infection rate is. I think that the infection rate is just going to go up anyway because people are like, oh, well, we're getting better. We can just go about, they're a bit more lackadaisical about the things because they're like, well, Freedom Day's coming. I don't need to wear a mask. And I just, it's it's self-defeating. It's inevitable the cases are going to rise, in my opinion. As long as we've got a Tory government that is as frivolous as they are, that are, are no focusing on the right things they need to be focusing on and instead trying to deport poor asylum-seeking children. I just, I'm so... F- I am, this was not a good day for me to do a podcast, by the way, because I'm so angry at everything. Pure rage. I get really angry when I saw a thing yesterday and it was saying how on the 19th of June, face masks will no longer be mandatory for MPs in the House of Commons. But it will be for staff in the House of Commons. And it's like, how blatant a uh, one rule for them, one rule for us can it be? And these these kind of rules are really important because see if you're saying that you don't have to wear face masks in a shop, for example, and that company chooses to say you have to wear masks. Who's the ones that has to enforce that? Mm-hmm. 
is the frontline workers who are probably on zero or contracts, probably getting paid minimum wage, who are going to be getting more and more abuse from certain individuals who are saying, I'm not wearing a mask because Boris Johnson said it's fine. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, if you're in a private space and someone puts rules in place, you are giving your consent to go into that space. And if you know, whether it, whatever shop it is says, you have to wear a face mask, you have to wear a face mask, right? <laughs> but that's not going to happen. And it's creating all these gray areas and it's going to pitch people against each other. So you've got people who do wear masks and you've got people that don't wear masks and you've got people that don't wear masks that are really, really aggressive and angry about it saying, this is, you know, impacting on, on my civil liberties. And I've never known civil liberties to be controlled by cloth on a face. I really never known that to be such a risk for people. Unless you're getting waterboarded. Well, there's that. Yeah. And then that's, you know, I'd say the waterboarding is more concerned. Than the face I don't think as there's going to waterboard customers <laughs> <laughs> that won't wear a mask. Maybe. Just... Maybe they should. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, and it's just, I think it just comes down to these, it's going to be frontline service workers, again, having to enforce people to, 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 to comply with rules that the business has put in place, um, and they won't be given any additional support to do that. And, and it just comes down to, ah, well, Boris Johnson said it's fine, so I don't have to. And then, you know, you've got these shop workers. And I think it's going to be even more confusing and more problematic if Scotland says you have to wear masks in a certain area. UK government say no. And certain, you know, businesses are putting in different rules in place. It's going to be confusing. And it's going to be, you're going to get certain individuals in Scotland saying, ah, well, I listen to Boris Johnson, no Nicholas Sturgeon. And this is, this is the problem that, you know, with devolution, because you've got different layers of government that people necessarily, A, don't understand where policy comes from, or B, just choose whichever one they want to listen to and and enact that. So it's just going to be a complete mess. And the people that are are going to be impacted by that is frontline workers, again. Of course, a lot of that confusion also comes from our media who refuse to acknowledge Mm -hmm. differences within the United Kingdom (laughs) that consistently... It no, like they always refer to the health secretary as the UK health secretary. Really, they're the English health secretary because mm-hmm. they don't have any jurisdiction outside of England. Um, who are the other nations of the UK have got their own health secretary? Yeah, the centralisation of media is another problem that is worth you know an hour long discussion as well. And we've seen it during the football, for example, where it's just been England football team, England football team, England football team. And um, but it's the same with COVID. So you'll get like a you know a five ten minute piece about the changes in the rules, and then the newsreader will go, "These rules will be different in Scotland and in Wales," and <laughs> and, and then they just move on. And it's like, well, what's the point in doing that lucky. whole five ten minute? If you're if lucky, you, they say that. Yeah, but. You know, that seems to be the most, that's what I've seen anyway. But not that I watch, watch a huge amount of mainstream media news, but it's almost like you'll do this long piece and there'll just be, you know, small part at the end, which, you know, the evolution of, of broadcasting is, is such a really, really important thing, which definitely during the pandemic specifically, news should have been completely devolved. So there was no crossover uh-huh. and it should have been very much, this is the rules here, blah, 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 blah. And not, you know, reliant on a BBC based in, in Westminster to try and primarily talk about English rules, but then, you know, slot in the Scottish and Welsh rules, which confuses probably the English viewers as much as it does anyone else. So let's just, you know, the, the devolution of broadcasting was something that should have been actioned relatively quickly when this pandemic started. I mean, it's things like the face masks. They're such a minor inconvenience for people. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like you cannot wait we can all understand like you know having to close down businesses and things causes massive problems for individuals but nobody's really that put out with face masks no matter what some of them claim and yet it has a big impact in uh, the infection rate so the fact that they're no even willing to keep something as low impact as that it's just mind-boggling and, and then at the same time they've made all these huge freedom day announcements and then the next day there's another minister come out saying oh i mean you probably still should wear a mask if you're in a tight confines and you're like why you send like why are you sending out all these mixed messages again? Mm-hmm. It's like, again, confusing. Clear and specific. Stop confusing people with backtracking and everything you say. But if you if you take a position on everything, then you kind of get criticised for anything. And I think that this is very <laughs> much, you know, because they could be like, well, oh, you know, infection rates have gone up. People are not wearing masks indoors. And you could be like, well, that one minister came out and said, uh, you know, on this date. And you're like, you know, basically they're just covering all bases by saying they should do everything. And then you've got certain um, MPs in, in the Tory party saying, well, I'll continue to wear masks in, in this context and stuff. And you're like, now you're just completely muddy in the water completely because uh-huh. people... It's people's anyway. lives we're talking about yeah. here when we're talking about muddy in water and all that. It's about, Absolutely, yeah. We're, 
what happened to let's protect the NHS, let's protect our frontline workers, let's protect the most vulnerable in our society. That's all went out the window again. We're back to slagging off people getting twenty pound uplifts. Ah, and 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 too we we look at last year when you know bef- before I think it was around about August time, September time when the rates were starting to go up when all these um, rules had been relaxed. And you had like Dominic Rapp going on saying everybody needs to get back to the office, you know, because poor Pret Amongji is going to close down and <laughs> all these types of things. And then, of course, within three or four weeks, the, play, the, the the rates are starting to go out of control and we end up in another lockdown. So if we could just, even if you just care about the economy, right, if yeah. you're really that soulless and you don't care about vulnerable people and you really care about the economy, go and just look at last year, right, mm-hmm. and, and just apply some of that caution that should have been there last year to prevent that from happening. I just, I, I don't understand it. Even from, from a libertarian point of view, even from a, a pro-market point of view, I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense. It and it's just very much like we need to get back to normal. Otherwise, people are going to stop voting for us. That's basically, that is that's, it. that's what it comes down to. Well, when we record our next podcast, it'll be, I think, the start of Freedom Day in England. And God help us, obviously. Mm-hmm. God help England. I can't believe I'm saying that. <laughs> well, we'll suffer as well because any new, they, any new variants they create is going to head straight up here rather quickly after. It's, it's inevitable. I don't see the end of this pandemic for a long time because we seem completely incapable of actually dealing with it. Our political leaders do. I thought we were just starting to get, as you said, a semblance of normal, normality, whatever that you know so happens to yeah. me but you're starting to see family members again and mm-hmm. it was just nice I was planning to go see my pals at a you know outdoor restaurant thing but pff, I don't know if I want to like it's too risky and and I think that a lot of people were actually accepting the way things were mm-hmm. you know that kind of it's felt like a sort of happy medium where there was no huge events happening and yeah there should have been more government support for these organizations I completely agree with that mm-hmm. but I think that we were at that stage where you could go for a pint, you could go mm-hmm. for a meal with your pal, you could, you know, do these different things. And to be honest, I think people would have been quite comfortable with that if we knew that if we kept at that pace for, you know, another three or four months, that it means we could completely eradicate the virus or take it down to really, really minimal levels. But the UK government have just said, well, you know, we've had enough now. The British people have had enough. They're basically telling the British people that they've had enough again mm-hmm. because at the start of this pandemic, they were saying the British people won't accept lockdowns rules or face coverings so they're just you know saying the british people want x y and z to suit their own narrative again so it's just important that you know we take that in context we're all going to be affected in different ways with it. i mean for me i could cope with see once we we're allowed to have people over to the house again and you'd actually see people and that was fine for me i could have probably coped with that for a long time once that was allowed but the thought of going into another a winter lockdown especially uh-huh. And no seeing any any of the it's it's a horrible thought. And yesterday I ordered a heater for out my garden because I thought, well, <laughs> I was hoping I wouldn't need one, but we're going to have if we're going to have visitors sitting out in the garden in December, then we'll definitely need a, a heater, a, a patio heater, uh, <laughs> definitely. Oh, what a sad sort of sad note to end on. Yeah, that is quite a downer. That is a downer. We're very sorry about that. If you're wanting some COVID advice, uh, how to stay safe and stuff, go and check out nhsinform.scot. Gives you all your rules and regulations. Don't listen to the Tories. Very much that. Well, another great podcast is the press as we all feel now. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. Deborah. Good to see you again. And I'll catch up with you again next week. Thank see you. Later. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening. I hope you found that both entertaining and informative. If you've got anything you'd like to hear us talk about at Holyrood Ungagged, you can tweet us at underscore ungagged, hashtag Holyrood Ungagged, or you can email us at ungaggedleft at gmail.com. So until next week, stay left and stay lucky. And it was nice, nice to you smile. Dream a dream cause you'll never die. The stars will never overtake. 